Well, welcome everyone to Make Shift Happen in Your Career. I'm Megan McKinney, Associate Director of the Duck Career Network in the UO Alumni Association. And I am so happy to introduce to you our guest speaker for this workshop, Anthony Trucks. Anthony is a former UO football player, NFL athlete, American Ninja Warrior on ABC, international speaker, host of the Awe Shift podcast and the founder of Identity Shift Coaching. He uses cutting edge technology, science and psychology to upgrade how you operate so you can work through what's been holding you back while elevating your life and business to reach your full potential. After being given away into foster care at three years old, being adopted into an all white family at 14, losing his NFL career to injury and more, Anthony learned how to shift at a very young age. Now his life mission is teaching others how to make shift happen in their lives. Anthony will set aside some time at the end of his presentation to answer any audience questions. So please submit your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now I'm going to hand it off to Anthony. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. You are ready. Hey, you guys got me for the next like hour. So first off, uh, this is this is a blast for me. And I do this like literally for a living. I talk and speak all over the country, all over the world, actually now. And so as we communicate today, the, I always like I wish the Zooms were like I could see your face, but it's OK. Here's what I can see the chat box. So as we talk today and I share these things with you guys, um, you're here to find out how to make shift happen in your career. The cool thing is. It'll actually make shift happen in any part of your life. Remove the F and you'll understand what it means. But if you could engage with me in the chat, because you got to think, I'm sitting here looking at a camera and myself, and I see nothing but nothing. So if you could actually say, hey, I'm here, hello. I love it. That would be helpful. Megan says, hey, welcome to it. So just give me a thumbs up, a hello. We got to go ducks. Okay, I got my helmet from when I played. Look at the helmet. Oh, man, that's my thing. We got to go ducks. We got Paige in here. Hey, Jen, Daniel, hello, hello. There we go. We got love from Eugene. Now I felt welcomed, we can rock and roll. So here's the thing, as we go into this today, I want to give you actual takeaways. Uh, my whole world is wrapped around how to make something amazing and crazy cool happen. Uh, shift is more about change management, but it's also how do we ascend and elevate and hit that next tier of, of joy, success, and all that fun stuff. This is intimately cool to me because I get to go back to my roots. Uh, I think back to when I was actually at Oregon, and this is where my, my life started. Like I went to Oregon as a boy and left a man. So I, I was there with my high school sweetheart. We're still married. She's also a duck. Uh, and my youngest son, we had him our sophomore year at college. Do not recommend doing that for anybody. But we had we had fun. We got to let's go. Duck. I love this. This is my people. These are my ducks. And just so you guys know, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. I live in a town called Concord. So if you're familiar with it, I'm out here. And it was cool to look back on all these years and be like, man, I get to come and talk to, to you having been through so many different navigating points of my journey of my career. And I'm going to share with you some nuggets that I've extracted from my life. I'm not going to go deep into my whole experience, but I really want to make it something where I give you some you can take away from here. What's crazy is that little guy you see there in the middle. That was my, his name's Anthony Mack trucks. Nick's name's his. He actually ran at the, uh, I think it was the Nike outdoor nationals this last year. And that's him in the middle. Now he's like my height, probably a little bit taller than me. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it to where he's never taller than me, but he's going to get there. It is what it is. Uh, from Japan. Hey, Yuka. So the idea today is how do we make shift happen? Because my career has been through a whole bunch of crazy levels. But here's what I want for you. I want you to be able to get to the, day, the, the way of, of looking at life. And today I'm going to teach you five steps that will take you uh, from wherever you may be at in your career or burned out or want the next level or overwhelmed or in the great resign to living a life you love. Now, life is comprised of the world we have at home, right? Your relationships, your happiness, your health, your joy, whatever you do, but it's also part of work. And if you do something you love to do, it's a whole different way to experience life. We're going to spend a vast majority of our time working. So we probably should have some time within that work falling in love with it. So if you're like me, I know that for you, you're here because you want more freedom, whatever that could look like, time, freedom, money, freedom, a combination of both. You want more money, right? There's nothing wrong with making more income to be able to create and do more in your life and be able to retire when you want to or create a cool business if it's an idea. You want more power. Power doesn't mean like, 
evil supervillain power, <laughs> none of that kind of, but like power, like to have the ability to have control that you do want more life. We all want to live more life and take trips and go to the places that we see on Instagram. I always find myself scrolling and I'll find out where they're posted from. I got a running list of places. I'm going to continue to keep going to see with my wife and my kids. And then we all want more joy. There's nothing that I want more in life than joy, like happiness. And, and, and I, I find that for me, doing things like this help create that for me. And so sharing is a big thing because I know we all have big goals. I don't know what it is. I would love this. Actually, just do me a favor. Share with me a goal you have for career in the chat box. That would be fun for me to kind of talk to some real things as we're doing this together. I don't want you to just be sitting there going like, this guy's talking at me. I want to talk with you. It's a lot more fun for me that way. I'm usually, you know, I guess used to get on stage and seeing thousands of people looking back at me. Uh, VP role, awesome, Jen. I actually work with an Amazon exec who's in that direction looking for a VP role. Invention, Emmanuel, okay, I like it. To work in a new industry, I have only ever worked in education. Awesome, Lauren, that's kind of cool. That's What's great is our world nowadays, we can do that. We can go in a whole bunch of different industries. Um, anything else you guys want to throw in there, feel free to. Side hustle too. Okay, never on a side hustle. This, this was my side hustle at one point as I owned a gym, you'll find out about and progressed up through multiple different levels. So in my life now, this has kind of been my journey. Uh, I was a guy that played college football, as you guys know, to become a full-time copywriter. Ooh, Dustin, that's for sure my world. Copywriting, fulfillment, innovation, my career to consider a wholesale career. Ah, I like this. I love my job at community college, but always too much work and not enough time. Sally, that's something that's a little bit different, but what's cool about it is actually part of the things I talk about will weave into this. So I like this. Beautiful. I love it. I just got laid off. I'm 62 and still need to work because I have health benefits. We want to do something new. Let's do it, Kate. We're going to find some cool things. So my journey is to understand why I even am a guy that should or could talk about this. So I, I did college football, went to the NFL. And obviously, the NFL is an interesting career because you get done and you don't have many skills. You could, I could tackle people all day. I could run real fast and do that, but I can't show up in the corporate world and all of a sudden be successful. So what I find is that you had to kind of take those intangibles and apply them somewhere, which I ended up doing. So when I came home, my degrees in general science, which is kind of like kinesiology from the direction I went. So I opened the gym and, you know, novel idea for an athlete. Let's go into fitness because none of us ever do that. <laughs> so I went in this direction of fitness, but I had a brain. And I started un unraveling different layers of my identity. Same as you. You have different things you are skilled at that are passions of yours that you have weirdly created some, some knowledge or skill set around. It's trying to find a way to express those. So for me, it was first in the fitness industry. I love talking and sharing and teaching and coaching. So I went down that avenue. And then in doing that, going down that avenue, I found, well, there's, there's value for other people outside of my gym that I owned that could allow these people to actually get some benefit from my brain. So I started consulting. It's a power company down here in California called Pacific Gas and Electric PG&E. And I started working with them and I, I was able to find a way to make great income on like my own like little traction made like, it was interesting. I got a quarter million dollar contract. It was like 220,000 of profit off of just ideas in my head. It's very interesting. And I went down there and we got it all rolled out and they loved it. We did consulting for a couple of years. From there, I was like, man, I really love this, this next level of sharing my brain. It's, it's lucrative. It allows me to have some more freedom. Um, I'm able to serve a whole bunch of people, it's like 5,000 employees we served. Then I go, I like this. And so I would start talking and speaking in that realm. And I was doing fitness at this time. And then I started getting asked to go like, hey, can you talk about your personal backstory? I'm not going to go deep into it, but I grew up through crazy. I was given away as, as a kid, three years old, foster care, adopted into an all white family, 11 years in the system, tried football, was horrible, got good, moved on, had a kid in college, as you know, met my real dad, my first collegiate start against Mississippi State. And in fact, this game ball right there, that game ball, I got my first collegiate start, my true sophomore year uh, against Mississippi State, met my dad, and we won the game. I got a game ball. Isn't that kind of cool? So it all happened in Oregon. Like, it is kind of crazy how it all kind of comes full circle. Uh, Dustin at Nike. I see. I just read the comment, Dustin. I'm sidetracked, but coming on back now. Then I go through this process of like, I love this. I'm doing fitness. Someone says, tell me about your story. Tell them about my story. I progress into telling about my personal backstory, which turned into a different trajectory of coaching and speaking and really unpacking the concept of identity because through all these levels of our lives, we're always expressing new parts of our identity, who we are, what we've learned and feeling more free to be us. And so as we look through this, I've made a lot of shift happen in my career. I, I now run full events where people fly to wherever I'm at in a hotel and I teach and coach for you know, multiple days. I then brought out to different places to speak in front of thousands. I do virtual trainings like this for companies like PayPal, Amazon, T-Mobile, like a lot of weird stuff. And it's all just interesting, fun things. Now, what I do know is this whole journey is an up and down. 
success is an interesting up and down and up and down. And for you, you can probably attest to sometimes you feel like you're on a high. Everything is moving smooth. And then you wake up one day and go, how did I get down here? How am I at this place where maybe I'm doing something I fought to do, but I don't quite love this. And we, we start spinning our wheels trying to find this next trajectory, this next traction. And so we end up getting to what I call a fog. I'm moving, but it's passionless. Like it doesn't feel like I'm alive while doing this. And so success becomes this up and down thing. And we're going to talk about very specifically, how do we look at this differently? Because here's what I know for us. A lot of the reasons we feel that way is there's a balance between our career and sanity. Right. The career is the thing we do because we got to be able to pay bills, live and support. But then our sanity is like, sometimes I don't like this career or my heart goes, is there more? Is there something else out there I'm meant to do is like, this is this it, you know, and and I know that question has sat on my heart many times. And then when that question kind of posed itself, I, I wanted to answer it and I would go and seek and find new different things. And so today I want to talk about how do we find a way to not just balance this, but throw the whole scale out the window and create a harmony for life that we absolutely love. Now, as we go through this, this process, it's going to be something where I'm going to ask something of you that you probably haven't done before, but I'm going to ask you to take a look at this. And this is a, a concept that, that I, I like. It's a cool one, and I'm going to share with you. Here's this concept. This is why we feel stuck sometimes. And what it actually is showing, you can't tell, is this is a statement. Listen to it. Here's how it goes. It is hard to see the label when you are inside the jar. It's hard to see the label of who you are, the career you have when you're in the middle of it. You're just, you're just here, right? And so I found that for us, sometimes we feel stuck because I can't quite see everything going on. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what's wrong. And so as we unpack this today, I'm going to walk you through a process that allows you to get to the point of figuring out, okay, this is the label on the jar of my life. This is why I feel this way, why, why I may desire more, because I haven't seen this, but we're going to help that blind spot become a visible spot for you. And this is a big thing. How do we make shift happen in our career? It's why you're here. How do we make it happen? Well, this is what I'm going to talk to you through today. If you got pen and paper, get it out. We're going to cover three fun steps. And these are genuine steps. Now, I'm going to preface it so you know what the steps are, so you can organize your notes if you see fit. And the first step is C. It's literally a process of seeing. I'm going to walk you through how to do it in a moment. Then we're going to talk about shifting, which is the action, the verb, the motion, and then how to sustain this, what the sustaining aspect is. Now, in my world of what I do coaching-wise, it's called the shift method. How do we shift from low capacity to high capacity? It's also the same concept of shifting from one place to another place, no matter how you frame it. So as we go through this today, we're going to walk through this and please take notes because you can refer back to this. And some of the stuff you're going to be able to do right now in real time with us together, and you'll be able to ask me questions at the end of how I can apply this, but let's rock and roll. So the first one to look at is going to be called the first stage, and it's also the C stage, look at a little windshield wiper eyeball thing. Isn't that kind of cool? I had fun making these slides for you. You better enjoy them. So here's how this works. There's a space, uh, which is kind of this process. It's a grid. Now, this grid is the grid I'm going to walk you through. And I want you to make this right here. If you have paper somewhere, you can write this down. Take screenshots if you want to take screenshots. But this is a grid that I typically call the ID phase grid, which is like essentially like your identity phase. What phase are you in of your identity? Now, it's the same exact conceptual application when it comes to your career. You and your career are a single entity, so to speak. It is you. If I ask who you are, you'd be like, I'm a teacher. I'm a coach. I'm a leader. I'm a copywriter, right? Whatever it might be. And so as we go into this, I'm going to guide you through and I want you to find out where you might be. Think about that in the back of your head. Where might you be in this grid? Then we're going to talk about how to move to a place, which you'll find that's the most ideal place on this grid. So on the left side, you see locked in, meaning are you locked into something you're doing career-wise? And the top, it's obviously clearly searching. Are you searching for something to do? Now, you're going to have an intersection of this at any given time in life. 100% you are in a position on this grid right now. So let's start simple and walk through this. The first part of this grid is if you are not locked into something, which means you are not in a career like I'm in mean, anything, you can't claim anything, and you're not actually searching for something, you're what I call lost. And it's not a fun place to be. You probably feel a little bit lost. And if you felt that, by all means, let me know. And actually, I would love this. If you guys see as you come up where you might fit, if you're bold enough, if you want to direct message me privately, that's cool too. I'd love for you to pop in a chat where you might feel yourself as we're going through this. But loss is a place that's okay to own. Sometimes our ego won't allow us to because we go, I don't want anybody to know that I'm not perfect, not great. But at the end of the day, owning the place you're at allows you to make progress. So what I've found is a lot of people are in lost mode. 
they're not locked into something where they identify as it and and they also aren't searching for anything that would make them happy so they float around for a long period of time bouncing around from career to career never feeling fulfilled never feeling like they've made it or arrived and so sometimes people aren't lost if that's you write it down now the next one we're going to talk about is something where you've not searched but you've locked into something this is what we call closed now closed you'd be like oh closed off's good nope not the greatest sometimes this is the person who, hey, my family, we're all bakers and we bake, or we're all doctors, or we're all cobblers, whatever it might be. And it's what you guys do. You know, mom and dad chart of the path and I have to go down this thing, or because I live somewhere, I got to do this, or I just, you know, I've always been kind of good. People told me I should try this, so I go do this, or it's been the trajectory since I was 18 years old. I've put so much time into it, I can't just leave it. It's a bad investment bias. An investment bias essentially says, I've invested so much time, I am biased to staying in this. This actually happens in relationships where people go, well, I've been in this relationship for the last 15, 20 years. I guess I kind of got to stay here because you know I don't want to leave and have to be for nothing. No, don't do this. Please don't do this. The idea is when you've been invested and you learned, like you have skills you developed, but maybe you don't love this career anymore. Maybe you've, you've got to the point if you feel closed off, your, your joy feels closed off, your passion feels closed off because you didn't look for something you may really want to do, which is kind of chosen. And so you went down and locked yourself in and now your belly doesn't have that fire every day and you're kind of just living to go home and the weekends are the, the best time of your life when I don't think that's how you should live. And so the idea is, are you possibly closed? And if you are, own it, it's okay. The next one comes to a place where some people are what I call open. I like open. I like it. Here's what open means. Open goes, look, I'm not locked into something, but I'm going to figure out what's out there, right? I, I'm going to go try things, sample life, experience things. I'm going to go see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do job, you know, like studies and just kind of follow people around, job shadows. I'm going to go do ride along if I want to be a police officer. I'm going to go and sample. I'm open to seeing things. Now, a lot of people are apprehensive to do this because they believe that if they are open and trying things, that it means they're like a leaf in the wind and they're all crazy. No, you can be wanderless and be okay. We got an open, I like it, Kate. So like, it's okay to be in that space. And I think it's a really good place to be. You'll find out why in a moment. The idea is to be open to life. I find that when we're kids, you know, the world is like this. Here's all the things we can do in the world. And then as we get older, we start doing things. The perspective of what's possible gets smaller and smaller. And I start living in this little box. And all I can see is this right here. And then we go, well, why can't I experience life? Well, because all of life is out here and all you see is right here. And so you haven't opened your perspective to go, what else is out here to experience? And that's okay. In the world we live in now, we can do this now more than ever with the history of humanity to open ourselves up to things. I think it's been more visible at a broad scale with so many millions of people resigning from work. And so open's a great place to be. Megan, thank you for giving that reminder. I can see the chats down there, guys. You get it engaged, it's fun. And so- this is a good place, not the last place, but it's a great place to be. Now, let's talk about the one that I like, which is the fun, the fun one we all want to get to. This is found. I found my place. You went and you searched to find things that were out there. I feel good about this. I found my place. I'm locked in. And a lot of people, you yourself right now could be found. You could be in a place you feel good. You feel locked. Oh, I'm good. I'm golden. I feel good right here. And here's the thing. After a while of doing this, you start learning more things. You start finding more people. You start all these things. Love it, Jen, thank you. You start finding more perspectives, new environments, new things that you didn't know you didn't know previously. That's the whole part of the world, right? There's what you know, what you know you don't know, and what you don't know you don't know. And the more that you lock into a place, Emmanuel's open, lost my like it, the more you lock into a place and you start experiencing life, you start meeting people and leveling up. And then all of a sudden, you start getting to this point of going, man, I'm seeing new things, but I'm found. This is my career, right? Uh, he says, I think I'm mentally open, but operationally closed. It could be actually. That's good. I like that. Kim, look, you're making me think. I'm going to come back to that. Leave that as a question. I would love to come visit that in a moment. So the idea is that we're found. We go, I'm here. I'm locked in. And what happens is after a while, you start feeling the, the passion die down. I, I, I want, I fought for this and all of a sudden it doesn't, doesn't give me that, you know, that fire in the morning and I get up and I'm going through it. I kind of feel like I've drifted from found to closed and there's more I could be seeking, but I'm not. Or maybe you're just found and this happens too. You've fought, you've climbed, you've built to the top of the two chain, right? And then all of a sudden you go, I don't, I don't love this, but you would feel guilty telling the world that you don't love it anymore because other people would love to be where you're at. People probably say it to you. Hey, I love this job. But I'm not in love with it. 
How could you not love it? That's what everyone would have to want to have your job. That'd be amazing to do what you do. But in your heart, you're like, yeah, at one point I had that, but, but life opened up. I started to see things and I'm looking at the back window shop and going, it'd be cool to do that. And there's this guilt. Yeah. Paige, she feels the guilt of like, man, I could, oh, I could, but I don't want to say anything. I'm just going to stay here and do my thing. I got a buddy named Dave Hollis. Dave Hollis is a phenomenal brain, great heart. And, and he used to work for Disney. He was the guy that was tasked with selling movies like the Marvel movies to theaters. Fairly easy job. And he talks about how while doing it, he got to this point of, you know, he loved it and he was doing really well, but he's, you know, he just had this itch to do something else. And he didn't know why it came and he felt bad about sharing it, but eventually he's like, I'm going to own it. And he took a step out and did something new. And he ended up joining his wife at the time to do a whole new projection of business. And they created something really cool. He did what I think very few people do. And because they don't do it, they minimize their experience of what life could be. We don't go and make shift happen in our careers. We just do our career and we kind of hang out in it. And he did this. He cycled back to open. Now, this isn't a one-way arrow. I believe this is life. I believe that what we should be doing is looking for something to do, finding something that we're passionate about, locking into it, enjoying it, and at some point go, you know what? If that little bug, and it may not itch, it may not ever come call to you, but if you're here right now, there's a possibility it has. Maybe you desire to level up, right? You wanna become, you know, you wanna go to be a VP. I want to open a side hustle, whatever it might be. At some point we have to say, we found this. I feel good, I'm making good money, but I wanna open myself back up. I wanna see what else is out there. I wanna try some new things. I wanna enjoy some new things. We're gonna talk about exactly how to do this in a moment, but I wanna try some new things. And so, gosh, I gotta, man, but the guilt keeps you tight or the desire to not be seen different or your bosses want you to think you're jumping ship kind of thing. So we stay small. We stay confined and we live in this, this cycle of suck where we're just living the days out and we go to the back end and go, man, I wish I would have, could have, should have. And I do not want that for anybody's life ever. So the idea is this should be a loop. You find something you can open up to level up in the same career, same industry, possibly, right? And then at some point you go, oh, I found something I like and I settle down for a little bit and I enjoy it and I do it. And then I go, oh man, I've a new thing. I want to try that. And we open up. If you notice, this is how I lived my life. Now, I'm not the perfect example of how to live a life. I'm human. I make mistakes. It's all crazy. But I, I was locked into football. And then I had to do something else. Open back up. I locked into a gym. And I was like, man, I want to do something else. Consulting. And I locked into consulting. And I go, man, I, I want to talk about more than just fitness consulting. And I opened back up. And I started speaking. And I locked into speaking. I started doing that. And then I opened back up to coach. And so it just progressed up. And this flow has allowed me to be in a joyful place in life. I get to experience things that, that are like out of this world cool. When I talk about make shift happen, I say remove the F and you get it, but really what it is, we'll call it by definition, is to accomplish something so amazingly fun and enjoyable that you have this explosion of positive energy wanting to flow out of you. If you can't relate to that emotion more consistently, then I, you got to start figuring out how to make something else happen, right? That's the goal to wake up and go, oh, I made this. I got this promotion, big business, whatever you choose to do, but you got to start pushing. And what it means is sometimes going from closed to open, lost to open, open to found and vice versa. That is for me what I call the open found loop. It's a process we go through. It's a consistent flow of always living life. So that's the first thing to understand is where might you sit? Now, you may not want to share it here and that's totally okay. If you want to, by all means, put in the chat. If you never put in the chat, that's okay. I still love you because I, I got love for my ducks. But that's the first part, right? The open found loop. But the big part is now, second step, right? How do we shift? Shifting's the plan, right? That's the, the process. And there are actually five steps to this I'm going to walk you through. By all means, write these down. You can apply them today. That's the cool thing. It could be applied today when it comes time. So here's how it all works. There are five steps. The first step is to unlock. Big, big piece, right? Sounds like my world opened up, but I didn't know what to do with it anymore. Ooh, I like it. Definitely cycling now. Ah, oh, I like it. I like it. It's part of the process. I like what you guys see. I like when you communicate to let me know you're here because I can't see your faces. Usually I can see humans' faces. So the chat box makes me see you. So the idea is that yeah, we have these processes, but now I'm going to talk about how do we start actually shifting. The first thing is to unlock. What this means, actionably, is to go to this point and go, you know what? I'm going to unlock and let go and release and let certain things find me. That's okay. I may just open up to have conversations with people I've never really had a conversation with. It may mean reading books, going to different conferences, different seminars, and seeing what's out there. But it's unlocking from the ownership that I have to be this. And here's the thing. Sometimes colleagues, family, even your spouse, they may not be 100% supportive of it. 
people typically don't like seeing someone they've known for a long time step into a place they don't know them to typically go. So this is where we get confined to our world because what if the judgments take place? What if somebody says something about this? What if I, I look funny or look different? And that, that's a weird thing because now what happens is you feel awkward doing something that really would make you happy. So what you end up doing is tucking back, playing small, not unlocking to try something new or even express you want to try something new. And you stay in that place and feel funky. Whereas to unlock a lot of the times is to openly in the world express, hey, I'm looking to try something new. I want to see if this is possible. And you go and seek to find something different. But you first have to give yourself permission to pursue it. If you don't give yourself permission, you won't do it openly or boldly, and it'll kind of just be you in the background. So the first step of this is to unlock. Go and say, you know what? I've been this, but I'm trying to see if there's something more for me to do. And if you're here right now, that's probably something you've already thought of doing or maybe already have done, right? Next step in the process is to explore. Now, exploring is kind of cool. This is the fun thing. Go find things. Literally, I would call friends, call family. I would go just, just talk to people. Hey, what do you do? You know somebody that has a cool career? What's a career I haven't seen before? You got to go find things you didn't know were there. This is the whole start to know what you don't know you don't know, right? To seek it. And this is a fun part about it. When we were kids, think about it. We would go and like, I want to go to grandpa's house because in grandpa's house is a garage. And that garage, it just feels like it's a smorgasbord of things I shouldn't touch, right? So you run around or you go camping. When you go camping, it's like all these different trees and birds and animals and snakes. Where I want to go explore these areas to see these new things. That same feeling you can have happen again while in your career. There's no reason why you can't explore and find different nuances and, and weird, cool things that are going on in life. And so you should seek to find that. Then what you do once you have done this is decide. Here is the hard one. Because once you've unlocked and you've went and explored, you have a decision. And this is the decision that can change your life. The decision is, do I go? It's simple. That, it, that's really what it is. Do I go in this direction? Do I stay here? And what has to happen is you have to make a clearly defined decision. If you do not, you will torture yourself because you'll go, I'm going to do this, but I might go here and I might do this and then I'll stay here. And then what happens is days go by and you start thinking about that thing you haven't committed to. And then you start feeling guilty. And you start feeling like maybe I should. You start feeling down or just, ah, oh, it's tough. And I never push past. Whereas reality is you have to make a choice, even if it means that I'm going to not go there and only go here, you have to release yourself of the thought of that. You can't ponder and stew on it anymore. Hard cut decisions. I tell people you have to get off the fence because it hurts your butt. Doesn't feel good. Choose a side. And once you decide, commit to it. Commit to doing what I say is go a mile down the road. Commit long enough to get something of a feedback to see how it feels, to understand what it looks like, to get more inter information about this area. You got to decide, though. Uh, Jen, great question. Uh, how do you get past the feeling of embarrassment? Got, got a great career, but considering things are out of there. Ooh, I like it. Jen, hold this one. These are good questions. Give me the end. I'm, I'm going to come back to them, I promise. So the idea is you got to decide something. Once you've made a decision, great. Now we have to do whether it is in the direction of something new or something you currently do. Now we sit back and we have to actually craft a plan. Most people's plan is hope and willpower. That's not a good strategy. It's, it never works. It's not something I've found to work. So the idea is stepping back and going, I got to actually craft a plan of what it may mean to educate myself, to do the uncomfortable things out of the normalcy of what I've currently done. Now let's take into account, let's say that you're trying to go in the same area you've already gone down. You're like, you know what? I tried this. I looked, I decided I don't want to do that. I want to stay here. Great. Let's craft a plan for progression in that area. What does it look like? What conversations must you have? What responsibilities might you need to take on? Who must you talk to? What questions must you ask? Start thinking of what must be done. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I learned this at Oregon. When I was playing, uh, Don Pelham was my coach. And he had this, this, uh, this military guy come in. And he said, you have to play one inch out of control. Now, what doesn't mean you actually play out of control when it comes to this stuff. What it actually means is you start thinking of what would be one inch out of my comfort zone. When you're crafting this plan of what the next step might look like, what would be one inch out of what feels normal to me? What's my common daily routine? What is that thing that when I think about it, it makes my, my whole body want to pucker up a little bit and get tight, right? That one thing. And the only reason that it makes you feel that way is because it's important to you. If it wasn't important, you would not feel that way. So that's a good predictor of if it should be an action you take or not. So whether it's in a direction you want to do or other side is, Here's a direction of something new I want to do. And almost everything on that will make your body pucker. But the idea is like, here's this new direction. 
unfortunately, most people go, all right, I quit my job. I do this new thing, a side hustle. I just got to go. And they rely upon willpower, determination, vigor, drive, hope. It's a feeling. And feelings are fleeting. You can probably attest that at some point in time, you were just on fire. And one day you woke up and go, where'd the fire go? You just woke up, it was gone. Because feelings are fleeting. The problem is we don't understand. Typically, there's got to be a plan to follow. And it can be based on hope and determination. So sit down and go, what are the actual actions and habits that must be infused into my life, whether it's daily, weekly, biweekly, monthly? How must they be infused that make me feel uncomfortable, but I know they'll move the needle in this direction? If you're starting a new business, it might mean cold calling people. Everybody hates that, but it might work. It might be touching base with your network, your alumni community and going, hey, what else is out there, right? It's doing those little bit out of comfortable, you know, or comfort zone stuff that those actions could create something new for you, but craft the plan so you can work the plan. If not, what happens, some people go out and they try this thing, but they don't try with the plan, doesn't pan out, they feel like they have to revert back to what they were doing. And they go, man, I don't like this, but I have to do this because oh, it sucks, right? So that's the idea. Uh, does putting an offer in a house after having just been laid off court as an itch outside? The <laughs> yes, Kate, that might be an inch outside the comfort zone. But I'll tell you what, sometimes that makes you do more than you're used to doing, right? So that's the plan portion of it. So when you're planning, think of something crazy that's outside the comfort zone. And you may also do this, engage other people. Get other human beings that are around you to sit down and go, look, uh, I got this idea. Can you tell me what I'm not looking at or thinking of? And you'd be surprised at how other people can help craft plans with you and structure. Typically doing this in the direction of a, a place where someone's already at, finding a mentor or a coach at a higher level that's where you're desiring to go. They're great resources to sit down and go, hey, you want to be successful? There's going to be a lot of stuff. Here's what to focus on. Here's the plan to put in place, whether it's an elevation or ascension in your career by promotion or a new venture you're doing. Get a plan. If your plan isn't perfect, have somebody help you with that plan. Fifth step is to expand. And this is actually the, the most important part of it. You're going to have to take a leap and go, right? The plan could be in place, but if you don't work the plan, it's no good. That's what they always say at the end of the day. A perfect plan followed poorly is no better than the poor plan followed perfectly. And the idea is to think about at some point, all this stuff happens in conversations in the background and it feels comfortable and like a little scary to think of a plan and unlock. But what's really uncomfortable is the expansion of that new thing to expand up and say, I'm going to be more, do more, fulfill more and actually take that feeling of a leap. Like it should actually feel like the picture a little bit of just, huh, and you go. And the crazy thing is most people will be so deathly afraid of this. They won't take the leap at all. And they'll stay in the backside and go, man, I want to have the fun that's happened on that side of the cliff, but I don't know. I don't, I can't push myself. And then they just sit in that little bubble and they feel crappy all day long. So the idea is to step back and go, where can I take this leap? And when will I? And when you do it, here's a big piece is to surround yourself with people who can keep you accountable and celebrate you, genuinely celebrate you. The reason being is because you're going to jump and you might stumble once or twice. You may not make that jump immediately the first time, but that's okay. Because every time you take the jump and take the leap, you learn a little bit more, you know, where your feet should be, how you should jump right physically. But then it may be the conversations you have or the job interviews you might go on those little things, take the leap, but don't look at that first problem and go, it's not for me because you are not the problem. The problem is the problem. You can work on that. You don't always have to look at yourself and go, I'm horrible. No, sometimes the thing you're going into is new and it's abnormal and it's not comfortable, but that's just part of the problem that's at hand. We can navigate that. It's a puzzle we get to solve. It's not that you're broken, right? So jump, expand, and trial and error is part of it. Enjoy the process at some point in time. When you navigate those things differently, things flow smooth. And then we get to the point of this, the last part, third part, which is sustaining. A lot of us will try things, and this is the, the fun part about trying something new. We try it, and then what happens is it hurts. It's painful. We try it, we step away. So I was just talking about, you have to get to the point where you try it, and it becomes normal for you to try it. You cannot identify with the outcome of the action. You must identify as a human, as a person taking the action, giving the effort whether it's in your current career trajectory up the ladder or whether it's in a new area altogether up a different ladder. The idea is to sustain the, the effort in the direction even when it doesn't feel amazing. This is when the energy dies down, the motivation dissipates. And I don't have all that vigor when I had that, you know, that vim and vigor, oh, I'm gonna go after it and that dies down. Now we gotta stay disciplined and sustain. 
the more you do it, the more momentum you gain, the more insights you gain, the more network you build, and the more you get what you want. Because that's really the big thing is most people don't sustain the effort. And really what it boils down to is getting to that point of living and repeating this when the pain returns, right? So when I get to that point, I go, man, this is kind of painful. Cool. Step back and unlock a little bit. What's going on here, right? I got to say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to explore that. I'm going to decide Then, from decision. I'm going to go ahead and make a, a choice. I'm going to create a plan. Then I'm going to go and expand and take the action. This loop continues on. You cannot wait all the time until the pain hits. You should get to that point of stepping back and going, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to live my life and I'm going to keep this process rolling. Whenever that pain, and by pain, I mean the pain of desire to create something new, do something new. Step back in and try things again and again. I think that's the beauty of life. The beauty of life is being able to get up every day. And, and in fact, if you take out the mental constraints of societal constraints or what our world says and what's possible, if you really give yourself space to dream like you were when you were a child, you start seeing there's a lot more possible. And when, when you automatically give yourself this story of it's not possible, we all live our lives in ways to make stories correct. If you say I'm stupid and not capable, guess what you do? You do things, you can go back and go, look, see, I'm stupid and not capable. But if you can step back for a second and go, what if, what if I can do this? What if I can try this? You start having that story in your head. Maybe Anthony, maybe you can do this. Hey, Jen, maybe you can do this, right? You start stepping in differently, start trying things differently. And now the story changes to where like, you know what? I'm a person that can try. I may not fully succeed, but I can try. And now the actions change. You start living in a way to make that story right. You start trying. And a funny thing happens when you try. At some point, you actually succeed. <laughs> like, that's the precursor to success is the trying. Most people don't try hard enough and they get stuck and they feel like they want to stay in the safe spot, which I totally understand. But when you're in that safe spot that doesn't feel great, here's a problem. The longer you stay there, the longer you stay there. So to make shift happen in your career, you have to step out of that space. And this is literally how you go through the process. You take a look and see, where am I at? What's going on? How do I feel? Where must I make shifts, right? That process of continuously going through things and where must I sustain? And when you do that, you will make shift happen in your career. And that is my sheer goal for everybody, like to have something you love doing and it's enjoyable and you feel like you get this passion around it, right? That's the goal. So I thank you all for coming and hanging out with me today. I hope it was in some way valuable and useful. I'd love to take some questions. Uh, if you are just curious, like, hey, I want to hang out with this guy some more, I do this daily podcast. It literally is free. It's just me. I talk into this mic and I do things. But seven minutes a day, I talk and give a little, it's called the Shift Starter Daily, hence the SSD. Go to textanthony.com or scan the little QR code. And that's it. You just get a little text message. I say, hey, this new episode. And every day it's a good way for people to start their days. So if you're like, I want some little motivation in the morning before you can start with your day, your career, your business, whatever it is, pop on and grab that. Easy, simple, just SSD. So thank you. I am done, but I'm not done. So I'm here to answer questions. Anything you guys want to know. I see there's some questions that already popped in. And this is the time where if you want to do it privately, you can definitely private message me or you can private message uh, Megan. And then we can just read it without it being you if for some reason you feel like I don't want to put myself out there. Um, but here's a time for you to kind of get any answers to questions you guys might have lingering. Well, Anthony, uh, thank you so much. I, I, let's jump into questions. I, I yeah. would love to go back to the question. Somebody asked, um, they said, I think I'm mentally open but operationally closed is mm. that possible yeah it's an interesting I, question it is a question so by operationally i'm going to make an assumption here by operation i mean it's how the actions take place the function the control and so what happens is this is the daydreamer there's actually a whole separate um concept what i call slower go identity and it's when you meet opposition and opportunity and in between where those two intersect it's a, it's a groove it's like a little grid as well what happens is i become a person who is called a dreamer now, there's nothing wrong with being a dreamer. We all need a dream. But the problem is, is sometimes dreamers just stay dreamers, which means my mind is open to try new things. But when it comes to operationally taking the action, I fall short. Now, it's not always a courage thing. Sometimes people, they see what's on the other side of the river. and They go, man, I want to get to the side of the river, but I, I have no idea how. And so the river looks like a rushing river that I will die if I step into it. So I'm not going to take the operational action to step in the river. So I'm going to look at that and go, man, I love that, but I, uh, I, can't, I can't go after it. And then I'm like, well, what if somebody walked up, grabbed your shoulders and turned you and you saw a bridge? Well, now I'll cross the river because I, I got a bridge. I know, okay, let's walk to the bridge. And I'm, a, you know, so it takes less effort and there's less fear to take the operational steps in the direction. 
So if you're in a space right now where you're like, man, my, my thoughts go there. Cool. That's great. Let the thoughts go there. What it looks like next is like, how do I build the bridge? Who has already built the bridge? Can I go ask them for the blueprints on how they built the bridge? Right. And now I get a little more, a little more, I will call it courageous, right? I have less apprehension, less fear to start taking the steps to try this out. And these should not be uh, immediate violent changes in life, people. Like this is not supposed to be something where you just come home and slam the door. I quit. Like, no, I'm not. <laughs> none of that. That is not healthy. You'll create more anxiety. You'll ruin the trajectory you're trying to go down because you'll be doing it for a purpose. I got to make money. It is rigidness to it. And that rigidity doesn't feel fluid and doesn't feel smooth and it won't even attach to your heart in a proper way. So realistically, the idea is to try these things slowly. So that aspect where your brain's going there, figure, you don't even have to walk over the bridge. Just figure out how somebody built the bridge or someone that has a bridge to get there and entertain the idea. It is completely okay to entertain an idea without accepting or taking action on it. Fantastic. Gosh, we've got a lot of good questions. I know you might have some that were direct message to you as well. So feel free I've, to jump in. If yeah. something's popping out yeah. at you that you want to tackle, um, looking yeah. at the Q&A box. Uh, how to deal with asked, imposter syndrome. Let's get one. Oh, oh yeah. Let's talk about that. Um, how yeah. do you deal with imposter syndrome when, <laughs> imposter syndrome when diving into yeah. something new? So this is an interesting thing because imposter syndrome, is, here's the thing. It should be that way. You haven't done it before. You should feel like borderline an imposter. The problem is we give imposter this negative connotation because we are trying to identify as that at the highest level of it. And very few people give themselves the grace of saying, I don't have to identify as the best speaker in the world, but I can just say, I identify as, as being a person trying to be a speaker. And that simple adjustment gives you some freedom and grace to go in. So first thing is it's okay to accept and openly say, I'm, I'm being a beginner, right? Now, the next part of this, when it comes to imposter syndrome, essentially you don't have experience there. And so you have this emotion that doesn't feel great. Like, oh, I don't feel powerful in this space. And essentially an emotion comes in the backside of an action. So think about it this way. If an action leads, I come in a room and I punch somebody in the face, they don't feel love. If I come in and give them a hug and a handshake, they feel love a little bit, right? It's an action that led to the emotion. So if this emotion is an imposter syndrome, there is an inaction or a poor action that led to it. The opposite. The antithesis is an action in the direction opposite. It's what I call an unconfident action. It's an action you don't feel 100% aligned with or you're know, like, I can do it, but you do it boldly and you get feedback. And you go, man, I, I, maybe I can a little bit. You do it again and you get feedback. And okay, maybe it wasn't the greatest. Let me try it again. And I do it again and I get feedback. And it's like, okay, I'm getting better. And the more you do it, the more you build up to something. It's kind of like, when I was a kid, I wanted to jump off this cliff as a kid. I remember it was a pine crest. It was this like a little strawberry lake thing. And everyone's jumping off the cliff. And I was like, I'm not a guy that jumped off the cliff. I would be an imposter jumping off. I might die. I'm going to die doing this, right? And so I stepped to the edge of the cliff and I look, oh, I can't do it. And at some point I ran back and just turned everything off and oh, it jumped and I landed. And in the water, it's like, oh, I could do this now. And I, where I was first afraid, now I'm like, oh, I'm doing backflips and squirrel dives and belly flops. Like, I can do this. I didn't feel like an imposter simply because I took the unconfident action. And the more you do it, the more you build. But the starting point for a lot of people that imposter syndrome is trying to say, I am an expert. You do not have to say you're an expert. You can say, hey, I'm gaining expertise. I'm learning about this. Hey, here's what I learned about this, right? And share it. They get feedback. And the more you do it, the more you collect information and filter, the more other people go, I love your perspectives. I love what you're doing. And the more it turns that completely around to where you don't feel like an imposter. I don't feel like an imposter talking about this. I've done it. I've lived it. I took a lot of weird, crazy actions, right? That I didn't feel confident about in the, in the beginning, but now I'm like, oh, I can talk to this. I don't feel like I'm, I'm being an imposter. But I did in the beginning, if I'd have popped on, I'd have been like, oh, no, I'm just trying these things, guys, right? But you lead in. The more you lead in, the more it flips around. And you have a full-fledged confidence living inside of you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's see here. What are some approaches to handling the embarrassment of trying something new? Oh, wee. It's, so here's the thing. Embarrassment is simply because this is who I see myself to be. And I have identified with the outcome. I kind of alluded to it earlier. So let's do, let's do this. I am in the process right now of starting this new uh, real series called Guilt Guy. It's, it's a discussion about the guilt that we have, which ties to our identity. It's a deeper dive. But essentially, it's like this guy, like, and he is guilt embodied, right? A little shirt on everything. And it's kind of like acting. It's essentially acting. Really is what it is. 
And when I go and do it, I am clunky. It's cringy. My wife goes, it's cringy. I can't watch it. I go, oh, no, me either, right? And there's embarrassment with putting it out to the world because I'm so polished. I'm a polished speaker. I get paid high amount of money to go and talk on stage and serve thousands of people at once. I'm going to put this thing out that sucks. We have what's called a defender identity in that position, which means I've had success. I don't want anything to take away from this mountain I've already built. So I'm not going to try anything new. I'm going to stay here. I don't want to be embarrassed. And I started realizing, you know what? I am not the things I've done. I don't have to identify with the speaking aspect. I don't have to identify with the career. No, that has to be me. I'm this guy. And I am a guy who identified with trying new things, giving effort. Yeah, I might fall on my face, but hey, I tried, you know, make fun of me. Cool. Hey, that's, I'm, that's totally cool. If you feel like you want to do that, awesome, right? But I'm going to keep trying because that's who I am to try. And so when you flip it from not identifying with the outcome, but identifying with the effort, the embarrassment or fear of it starts to kind of trickle away. And here's also the other thing. You have to take into account who is judging you to make you feel embarrassed. Sometimes we think that we have to take every piece of insight in. And I'm telling you, the internet, everybody has a microphone and everybody doesn't need a microphone. I'm dead, dead honest. They don't all need to have perspectives that we can all hear. And so you have to take into account that there are going to be people that just don't like you. And that's normal. I'm a man of faith. Not everybody loved Jesus, right? So at the end of the day, it's like, not everybody's going to love you. And that's okay. But those who do care, support, celebrate, when they see you do what you do, they will celebrate your effort. Think about when you were a kid, like if you're a parent, like your kid can do whatever and they can feel embarrassed. You go, it's okay, honey. You did great, right? You need those people because those ones will let you stumble and fall and they'll help you back up and let you go do it again. And eventually you get your feet and like, oh, you're not walking, you're running at it. So when you've had a stumble, realize you are not, you are not the failure. You're just a person that tried something new and be happy about that. Some great points, Anthony. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's let's keep going. There, let's keep it going. Questions. Um, here's one. I am a single mom with two kids, working full time, no child support. I would love to take a risk, but I am scared to leave the safety of insurance coverage and guaranteed income. Naturally, mm -hmm. um, I worry about being able to support my kids. Yeah. Totally get it. I uh, I, I live in the same boat too. I had a, a career. Here's what people to know is when I jumped out of the gym business. I literally just, I jumped ship. I tried something new. I didn't have everything taken care of. At one point I had like 1500 bucks in my account. I had to borrow money from my ex-wife at the time to pay for like Christmas presents and rent. Like it was scary. I've been to that place where it's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and here's the thing is we have to let ourselves fly free sometimes. Now you have the things security wise you have to do. But I think when I say fly free in our outside time, when I get home, we have typically told ourselves a story of, I'm busy. I don't have time for X, Y, or Z. Totally get that. But in our world nowadays, there are so many areas where you can learn something and make money in the background. There are people that are faceless. There's a woman who opens up toys on YouTube and makes $5 million a year. Like, there's just a lot of different things. Now, she, that's a lot of money, right? But there are people I know who they have started small and built little e-com businesses and little nuanced things that give them six figures a year passive. No one knows them. You'd never see their name. They run some arbitrary business. It's just a matter of what education do you have to learn about that, to practice that, to try that. And that's a journey that most people go, that's a long journey. Ah, oh, it's going to be so long. I'll start it later on. And we just keep letting the days go by. Whereas for me, I'm really big. If and that's your situation, what's going on, give yourself an hour a day. If you gave yourself an hour a day, which I know we spend and easily spend scrolling on social media, watching TV shows that don't serve our life, that don't give me freedom, we are wasting that time. 100% you can find at least an hour, if not more. I find it all the time when I work with people. The idea would be to go, okay, what if I can spend an hour focused, distraction free, kids are in bed, whatever it may be, and I'm gonna learn about this. And I'm gonna go consume this. I'm gonna try this. And it builds. It's a, it's a momentum builder. It might take you a year, right? But think about it. If you did that, during the weekdays, during a month, that's 20 hours. 20 times 12, 240. You tell me if you spent 240 hours this year consuming information about something, you wouldn't have the ability to try something new, right? That's how the mentality has got to flip. But if we keep telling ourselves, I'm too busy, I don't have time, I can't do it, then you're going to keep living that out every single day. And then you'll be stuck in that reality of I can't do anything because you told yourself that and you lived in a way to make that right. But if you tell yourself, you know what, I can find an hour you'll find the hour. And if you don't know what to do, you feel like, I don't know what to do. Ask somebody who is in the position you want to be. Reach out, 
bold, unconfident, ask a question. You'd be surprised how many people will actually say yes. I had a guy reach out today who's a former NFL athlete. He, uh, he used to be the foster care system also like me. And, and typically when people like, can I pick your brain? I'm like, man, I, I don't do that. I typically, it's like, I, I have built up a, a business and I've, I've spent so much time and energy to learn this. So to give it for free, it's kind of like, say I'm a, I'm a farmer. Here's all my milk for free. Right. But I say, you know what? He, he reached out and he asked and he did it in a respectful way. And I have some ties. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to help him out. Now that's something that I wouldn't always do, but he got through. Imagine if he didn't ask, he doesn't get the insight. He's stuck trying to figure it out by himself for a long time. Whereas for you, you don't want to be stuck in that same position. So go ask, reach out and allocate even minimum, at minimum 30 minutes. Give it 30 minutes. At the end of a year, it's 120 hours, you know, just let it stack. And that's also saying you don't even touch your weekends. If you can commit to that, you'll find a pathway. I promise something will open up. You'll be one of those success stories. That's the only difference between most of the time people who are successful or have that next thing and who don't. It's the action that they actually took. I love that. I, I will be the first to admit that I catch myself spending way too much time uh, on social media, uh, you know, just, and then I think, gosh, what, what, what could I do with all this extra time if I wasn't scrolling through my phone? Great reminder for all of us. Absolutely. Um, all right. We've got some time to fit in a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, all right. How do you remain motivated when you face multiple rejections from something you know you're meant to do. Yeah. So the rejection thing sucks because we are humans. And one of our greatest fears is not being part of, right? It's that, that cast out feeling. We're tribal beings. And so when we are trying to enter that new space of being cast out, it's a painful, painful experience. And I know, because I've been rejected. I've tried to do things. You know, we some in the beginning of my business, you know, we hop on calls and clients be like, I don't like it. You're like, oh man, I suck. And what I've realized is, is there's a process to get into the point of, of eliminating the fear of rejection. And what it looks like is imagine that there's a pain scale of 10 of 10, right? 10 of 10, we'll just leave it there. What happens is I try this thing and I get rejected. It feels like a 10. Ugh. And most people go, I don't want to feel that again. Like I'm out, right? And they walk away. The other person goes, yeah, it hurt, but oh, okay. You know what? I learned this thing. And if you didn't openly learn it, ask, hey, why, why not? Why didn't it work, right? Do the uncomfortable thing. And then you got some information and then it's fearful. You go back and try again. And it's like a nine and a half out of 10. It's still painful, right? If you think about it, it's still off, right? And most people go, I can't do it again twice. Oh, I'm out of here, right? And then somebody else will go, no, I'm, I want to I have it. I, I got to find a way. Okay, let me ask again. What happened? And then do it again. And then I go back and it's a nine of pain. I'm like, oh my, and people are going, are you masochistic? What is wrong? Why are you, why would you, would you just stop? Look at the world's giving you feedback, right? For example, for me, I had my gym business, nine months into my gym business, I was looking at bankruptcy. I couldn't run it, had no idea what to do. I was, I served an eviction notice from the landlord because I hadn't paid rent in three months of my gym business. And I was looking at legit bankruptcy and my wife and my best friend both said, chalk it up, file bankruptcy, do something else. The two closest humans to me, I was like, I, I, this is pure rejection. I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, nope. And my weird, I was like, I'm gonna figure it out. And I leaned back in and I hired a coach and did this stuff with money I didn't have that, that was accessible to be, I had like pulled out credit and figured it out. But three months later, we're making seven times we were before and we were smooth right and built something cool in time. But I said to say that it, it kept being painful. Here's a task I had to do. I had to make a list of 200 names and call the names and say, hey, we're struggling. I need help. Do you or someone you know want to train? Friends family. Oh, it was so painful. The thought of it. it made me sick doing it. The first time I did it, oh, it was painful. Right. And the second time I called somebody, I was like, I'm going to throw up. And I kept doing it. We got about a hundred in by a hundred in it broke wide open. People were bringing our friends. It blew up and it was the painful step of doing it again. And here's what took place. After you go from 10 to nine to eight to seven, you get down to zero. Eventually it takes time. The rejection comes in. People are like, I don't want to, you know, that happened. I got a lot of, I probably, I would say at least 50% were like, like, uncomfortable rejections from those calls, but I just kept going and I learned something new and learned something new. By the time I got to zero, I felt good, but here's what people don't grasp. Zero is not painless. Zero is joy. The thing that I was deathly afraid of, it drove me in. Oh, I can't do Right. And I get to the point of doing, it, I'm like, Oh, I'm a cold call king. I'm a car by the world. You know, like, and it changes. Now this thing that you're afraid of, you have a skill set around, you feel powerful to do. It's a joy point. And a lot of us break too early and don't get to the joy, but we've done all the work to progress towards it. So when you have the rejections, realize it's information. 100%. I 
And I hope that that visualizer to see, because you've probably heard it before. That's feedback. Failure is feedback. It sounds good, but you're like, what do I do with that? You're trying to build down to zero so you find joy. That's why you do it. So don't look at it and go, it's too painful to look at it again. Go, no, it's painful. Where is the lesson? What can I bring in to refine and go do it again and do it again and repeat that process? The more you do it, the less rejection feels like failure and the more it feels like a cool class to get to hang out in because you're not the rejection. You're just the person trying to get better. And then you get real good and you go, hey, look at me. And you feel much better about yourself. Yep. Natalie, I agree. That's an amazing outlook. Thank you so much, Anthony. We've got just a few minutes left. I'm going to squeeze in one more question. Let's do it. I want to get to this last one that someone from the audience submitted. Uh, what would you say about being open, testing new things yeah. out, building experiences while you're still working full time? I find there is a lot of possibility to being open, trying new sides, of, of my current company uh, that ends up translating into doing a lot of work for free and mm. it's exhausting. <laughs> yeah, well, don't do it for free. I mean, it's first part. Uh, it's interesting is most people, and I don't know the 100% of the situation, but when you're in a position and you're learning something, right? Sometimes you do want to, you can charge because if you have an experience that is valuable to somebody else, consult. You don't have to be a licensed consultant, but if you spent you know, the last, I don't know, seven years learning this specific program, you can go and consult for a company completely separate and go, hey, you may be a different industry completely. I'm going to consult. I've been using this platform, this program. I can consult your team on how to set this up. I've already done it this company. There's no reason why you can't do that, first off. Secondly, there's always this fear of like, I don't want to do a bunch for free because if I do it for free, I don't have the value, but I know I want to, I got to do it for free to get a clientele base and a clientele list. And, and the reality is you don't have to do it for free, but sometimes you might, because we, we don't realize people go, well, is it worth my time? And I go, well, if you don't have expertise there, then your time's not worth very much. It's a hard pill to swallow, but it might be the reality. But here's the thing is when you go in and do this work, you can build up your value. And I usually, whenever people are going to do things for free, I say, hey, here's a window. I'm going to try this for about 60 days, 30 days. I'm going to try this with you. Um, but at the end of that, I want to revisit our conversation about possibly looking at being paid for this. So you set that up when you start. So they realize there's a time frame, a window at which you're going to do it. You don't just preemptively open it and go, I'm going to do it for free. Because then it's hard to have the conversation later of like, hey, I've been doing it for free, but hey, can I get money for it now? Like, it's hard. But set the tone. Like, doesn't mean they're going to pay you for sure. And you can tell them, it doesn't mean I'm for sure going to, you know, be paid, but I'd like to at least come back to the table and see if what I have done is of enough value to you to possibly get paid for it. And so that could be a way you can step into it by having that conversation way in the beginning before you even enter into the whole agreement. Fantastic. Well, Anthony, I, I'm afraid we are out of time. I, I hate, I, I wish we had more time because I feel like we can continue to learn so much from you. You are just a plethora of information. Um, and, you know, on behalf of the Alumni Association and the Duck community, um, I just appreciate your willingness to share your expertise with us, um, especially for those that are looking to make some change in their lives or as you say, to, to make shift happen. Make shift happen. Make shift happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are going to share a link to your website, Anthony, in the chat box. I encourage yeah. everyone to stop by Anthony's site, learn about his programs, learn about his coaching services, listen to his podcast, um, check out his book, Identity Shift. Um, Anthony, just thank you for helping improve the lives of others. Uh, yeah. Keep up the good work. You're fantastic. Oh, Thank you. I appreciate letting me come and hang out with the people. I appreciate this because honestly, I, I love I love my alumni group. I love the Ducks. It's always yeah. like anywhere I'm at, I'm always like, go. You can tell true Duck fans if you say go Ducks and they say Ooh. it back, I'm like, ah, that's my people. But um, thank you. Seriously, everybody, thank you. thank you for coming. I always look yeah. at it as I'm taking time. And I want to make and, sure I give something back with that. Thank you. And to our audience, uh, thank you for tuning in. I'm going to be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, it will contain a recording of today's webinar. So anything that you didn't catch, you can go back and watch and learn all over again. And um, if you are looking for ways to get involved with the Alumni Association, go check out our website. We're going to pop the link into the chat box. 
um, stop by and fill out a get involved form, view upcoming events, learn about regional alumni chapters and affinity groups, and explore the benefits of becoming a member of the Alumni Association. So with that, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, have a great rest of your week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and go Ducks. Go Ducks. I love it. All right, everybody. Bye.